Uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this uh, session. Uh, uh, it's uh, a meeting of uh, the American Nuclear Society's Risk-Informed Performance-Based Principles and Policy Committee, RP3C, we call it. Uh, my name is Prasad Kadambi, and I'm chair of RP3C. The purpose of RP3C is to help modernize ANS standards. Modernization has come to mean that risk-informed performance-based methods are employed to overcome the difficulties that we all know about with purely deterministic and prescriptive methods. We have been calling these methods RIPB approaches. RIPB is now part of uh, the uh, statute in the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. There's a lot of guidance available on RIPB approaches, but most people have not had reason to become familiar with the guidance because the conventional approaches still dominate most things that we do, including standards development. RP3C initiated these community of practice sessions, COP sessions, we call them, uh, on RIPB methods and practices to enable practitioners of these approaches to share their knowledge and experience. We have scheduled these uh, meetings uh, sessions to be on the last Friday of every month at, at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this month, uh, you know, we begin uh, the year 2021 uh, uh, after a rather eventful 2020 where we had eight of these sessions. All of these uh, sessions are available on the ANS website on the RP3C webpage. Uh, today, what we will be hearing about is a standard that is a work in progress, ANS 20.2 on uh, molten salt reactors. And leading the discussion is John Kutch. John, please go ahead. Hey, <clears throat> thanks Prasad. That was awfully nice of you. Uh, so Prasad asked me to give a little bit of a feedback and commentary on how we've seen uh, the uh, RIPB uh, applied to uh, the, the writing and the, uh, um, well, the actual uh, definition writing of the uh, molten salt reactor uh, uh, work that, that we're doing with the ANS 20.2 uh, writing group. Hopefully there's not too many of the people from there so they can't uh, wring my neck later when I, <laughs> if I get this all wrong for him, but uh, I covered my tracks by asking for, for input from the group. So we got, we got enough other folks that we can blame. <laughs> so, so I, I uh, when I started this out, you know, Prasad and I spoke a little bit about, about what it was that we'd seen inside the group. And I kept, I kept writing it down as R-I-P-D as in dog. And I'm like, like the movie? And, <laughs> you know, and I, I just kept having this vision of the of the old movie uh, uh, from 2013 coming into my head. I'm like, ripped. Oh yeah, that's cool. You know, right? That's exactly what we need in the standard. <laughs> so, uh, so anywho, uh, it, it wasn't RIPD. It was RIPB, as in boy. And uh, you know, as uh, Prasad said, as and I'm sure you all obviously know, but for those who don't, it's risk informed and performance based. There's actually a little bit of, uh, you know, we actually internally yesterday had a tiny bit of a discussion over what exactly, you know, does risk and information and performance even mean, you know, and, uh, but uh, obviously this is uh, answered to a great extent in a fairly uh, detailed document called Intro to RIPB Safety and, and uh, it's, it's available at the uh, uh, RP3C landing page at ANS that uh, I stole these snippets straight out of it. Uh, and uh, 
this I thought was the most succinct summation of, you know, what's the point of this? You know, what's, you know, what, you know, why would you do this? And, and uh, I'm not a monster. You know, this is a very wordy presentation. You know, I don't have any really good pretty pictures to look at. But, uh, you know, the presentation will be available. The video will be available. You know, you guys can read as well as anyone, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, I'm just here to give you my top level response to some of the questions that are posed on these, on these next uh, very few pages. And, and then we can get to, uh, oh, oh, this never fails. So, <laughs> anywho, uh, um, the, uh, uh, what we, uh, what we have here is uh, the the essential the essential takeaway here is that the the process is meant to make things more flexible. This is my takeaway. This is why I put my initials next to anyone that's my takeaway. This, this is not the group's assessment. This isn't Prasad's assessment. This is what I take away. This is why it's important, and you you know, and this is why we discuss it quite often at, at ANS twenty point two uh, group because. It is, a, it is a important tool for making things flexible and for making a design uh, that can uh, accommodate uh, unsurety and, uh, and risk, which uh, you know, is what we need when we're gonna design a brand new advanced reactor, first time in 50 years sort of reactor. And it's, it's there to, to make licensing uh, uh, you know, rational, and instead of just pure prescription and trying to fit the round peg into a square hole, it it makes it. I think it it gives a, a certain level of rationality and flexibility to the entire process. And so, a little more on my personal take. Like I said, you know, I'm not a monster. I'm not going to make you. You know, I'm not going to read this back to you. You guys have eyes. Uh, <clears throat> but essentially, the the top level takeaway is that it we haven't <clears throat> one of the things was uh <clears throat> excuse me one of the things was that uh prasad asked well is it has it been a challenge to put this in and it's, and it's like no i don't think anybody in the writing group challenges uh ripb's worth as as a tool in the toolbox i think the only <clears throat> thing that's come up has been that you know there is a there is a there is a few folks that think it should be, you know, fairly exclusively the the only way to to make arguments, uh, and and uh, I and the vast majority of the other folks in uh, ANS twenty point two, just you know we think it's part of the toolbox, and uh, it's an incredibly powerful and good tool, and it's a new tool, relatively new, and it should be applied, but. You know, it's just like if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And we have other tools that are more appropriate for different uh, uh, for different problems that need to be described, different risks that need to be assessed. And uh, when we're we're making code cases, the NRC, you know, you don't, you know, there might be more straightforward means of of making that. And uh, you know, so so. You know, I don't mean to be shrill about it, but you know, one of the big problems here is that, <clears throat> you know, there there is a lack. Uh, you know, for instance, a light water reactor has seventy years of of information on how it runs, materials, performance data, all of that. So that's an excellent, excellent application for RIPB because you have the information to be informed about. Whereas the last molten salt reactor that actually, the, the last and only molten salt reactor that ever ran, you know, stopped running over 50 years ago. And even though there's a, as my little footnote down there says, there's a huge historical library of, of information and uh, measurements and uh, information about components and ways that were tried, ways that failed, and even uh, methods that were tested to destruction, which is a, you know, probably the gold star way to test something, is to test it, you know, and get a mean time between failure and 
and all that. And, and you just can't do that unless you make things, right? Uh, you can conjecture, but uh, that, that becomes a, a bad uh, substitute for actual real world testing. One, one thing I have some experience with is that I know that there are some fuel salts, different fuel salts. You know, the famous ones are Fly, Flynac. There's a lot known about those. Some of the other fuel salts that are just as valid to consider using because they perhaps they don't use lithium, they don't use beryllium, they don't create tritium. So that's a great set of reasons right there to use it, but try and get material properties for it. Try and get NQA1 qualified fuel properties for it with salt that has fuel in it. Just, you know, if you do that, that is an arduous and unbelievably difficult task. And, and, it, and it has not been done yet to anybody's satisfaction. And so if you're gonna do thermal hydraulics, or even if you're gonna just design, you know, valves and fittings to work with this material, and, you know, for instance, what kind of, uh, what kind of fluxing ability does this, fluoride salt are famous for fluxing together pieces of metal and cross-linking metal. What do we know about that? Well, uh, as of today, we know almost nothing about it. And so how do we apply that to a risk-based, you know, system? Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I think uh, we could use some of this historical, beautiful data, but in the end, the only thing that's gonna really matter is if we build a valve, fill it up with actual, you know, salts that are gonna be present in that valve and open and shut that valve until you see what happens. And uh, so I think you guys get it. I don't need to beat this horse. Oh, by the way, as if you didn't get what Pat was saying, if, if you need to make a point and you just can't wait or you just absolutely can't stand the things that are coming out of my mouth, you can jump in and scream at me. It's fine. You know, there's no, you don't have to raise your hand. It'd be nice, but you know, we can, you can just jump in. Don't worry. We're getting right to the end of the, the torture session here. <laughs> so anywho, the, uh, uh, the, the end, the end game here is that uh, I'm not just, you know, presenting this, I'm presenting it from the group. So here's some members from the ANS 20.2 group. Brian Johnson from Terra Power uh, has a very similar uh, assessment as to what I just said. Cyril Roddenberg from Terrestrial Energy, uh, you know, uh, also uh, presents the the uh, the conundrum that if you're making ass assumptions and you're building computer models, for instance, on it, and then those computer models are used in other computer models, then you're just you know you're building a you're, you're building assumptions upon assumptions. And, you know, you could get a, a fairly bad uh, leveraging, multiplying effect of, you know, the old computer program, you know, uh, saying of garbage in, garbage out. If we start out with assumptions that turn out to be uh, ineffectual, well then, you know, we could have the greatest CAD model, but if we start plugging in CFD information or finite element analysis information, or neutronics information, MCMP information into it that are based on, you know, bad chemistry, uh, bad measurements, or non-existent measurements, and just a guess. Then you know what we can't, you know, we can't reliably use those results to to make a, a licensing argument or even a an investment argument, can we? Amir makes a very strong statement that you know he would. He would want this to be a primary approach for any advanced reactor. Uh, so those full statements, by the way, up at the top, if that was a little unclear, <clears throat> they, their, their, uh, their feedback to me, their input was much, much longer than these clips that I have here. And so if you wanna read their full comments, um, they are available in a Word document that I gave to uh, Pat Schroeder and, and Prasad. So uh, a little, uh, a little sort of uh, assessment here is basically, you know, how do we make RIPB indispensable? How how do we make the information? Well, you know, I think one thing is uh, 
we just flat out have to get real information, right? And uh, this has been one of my big arguments about advanced reactor companies. They are tiptoeing up to the very dangerous, dangerous edge of a cliff in public eye of just being called paper reactor. You know, uh, I, I heard the new term, it's a PowerPoint reactor. It's not a paper reactor anymore. No one uses paper. So we have a lot of companies out there that are in danger of just being considered PowerPoint reactors. And somebody pays a couple thousand bucks to do a, you know, to do a little computer animation and they get a little turntable animation of a reactor spinning around in space and it all looks super great. But when you break it down, I could count on two hands companies that have actually been building, you know, tubes and pots and pipes and pumps like Alvin Weinberg used to say, and filling them up with salt. And I can count on even one finger, the company that's actually been filling that, you know, those vessels up with, you know, uranium salt. And so that is not good enough to build a, a code case on, right? And that's not good enough to do risk or performance-based anything, really. Uh, even even with the amount of historical data and just standard engineering data, if we don't build big things, not scale things, full size things, and fill them up with real, actual, hot, dirty salt, you know, worst case scenario type situations, uh, and unless we have the facilities to do this and test them to failure, then I don't think. I would be willing to believe the, the uh, you know, just the theoretical assessment. You know, I, I am famously uh, a little bit uh, suspect of uh, FEA work that isn't based in, you know, reality. And uh, I'm even more suspect of CFD work. Uh, and I know for a fact that when you try and do CFD with fuels that self-heat, from internal radiation, that is the hardest computational fluid dynamic problem there possibly is. And uh, I know we spent uh, a great deal of time trying to solve that problem. And that was in a theoretical environment. Now, how do we know we were right when we got to the end of that project? Well, until we build the actual real world, I know, I know everyone loves to talk about digital twins, that's what I do. I come from, you know, I still run an engineering company and I come from a CAD environment. You know, we were doing 3D CAD in the middle of the 80s. So I am a big, big believer in digital twins, but you know, digital twin means two. You have the digital twin and then the other twin is the real twin, you know? And so we need, we can't just have the digital part of the digital twin. We need the the other, we need the existing in IRL, in real life twin. And uh, like I said, I'm not a big fan of scale models. Uh, scale models are incredibly deceptive. People don't get the difference between a geometric difference. Uh, you know, the a geometric scale is a big difference in a logarithmic scale, which is different than, you know, and so, why, why get into the scaling issues? Just make it, make the damn thing as big as it's gonna be and beat it up until it breaks. And now you got your data. So that's, and we did this. This is what's so maddening when you look into the history of this. INL built 70 test reactors. And then for the last 40 years, they built none. You know, so it's, you know, I'm sure there's probably an INL person out there who just, you know, who just burst a blood vessel in their eye, but. You know, the, the fact is we used to know how to do this. We did it safely. We did it carefully. People did not die. We have 85, 90 year old nuclear engineers that can attest to the fact that they weren't, you know, cowboys, they weren't insane. They wanted to go home to their families at night. And, you know, why did we stop trusting people to do the right thing and, and do what needed to be done in order to build a great nuclear industry? I mean, the build out of American nuclear, you know, uh, far exceeding 100 reactors in essentially 10 years. No one does that today. China isn't building that many reactors. Russia isn't building that many reactors. We were able to do that. And 
essentially we did it safely. We could have done it, you know, more like the French with standardized parts, probably would have been smarter and better for the industry. But the fact is we did it so we can do it again. Because I don't know anybody with an advanced reactor company that isn't talking about building these things in a factory, building lots and lots of them. And so if you want to build a thousand reactors in 10 years, well, you better start by building one and getting it to work. And, uh, you know, Christian Abilene's project is, is extraordinarily admirable. The, you know, the versatile test reactor, if, if we can get that done, that would be a huge asset to the United States nuclear industry or whatever else, you know, pick your, pick the company of the day that you want. If you want to do a big molten salt reactor, then let's build a big molten salt reactor and see what happens. Uh, so that's technically the, the end of my, uh, my commentary there and my takeaway from my experience of trying to incorporate this into uh, the uh, rules and definitions and uh, description of a molten salt reactor that we're working on at ANS 20.2. Yesterday, Prasad and I had an opportunity to, to discuss, you know, what would be some follow-on questions, and this is where we'd invite all of you to also give your two cents. Uh, the first question is, uh, let's take an inventory of what we do know about MSRs. Is there any reason that we should doubt what we think we know? And, uh, excuse me. And, and my answer, you know, I, while you're formulating your own answers, my answer is, I do not doubt what was recorded by the heroic M MSRE team. You know, I, I, uh, I had a great opportunity to get to know some of the last guys that actually operated the MSRE. And uh, thankfully, you know, several of them are still alive and still able to share their experiences. And they're the only people on planet Earth that have had that experience. And maybe the Chinese will in a few months or years. But as of now, they're the only ones who know. And uh, they're, if you read their records, you know, the, the ones that are still available out there, uh, the ORNL documents from the MSRE experiment, it was the most beautiful writing written in plain, understandable English with, you know, beautiful tables, great results. But even some of that information is not available. You know, for instance, we tried to replicate the thermal hydraulics of the MSRE and what they saw in real life and we couldn't do it because the drawings that show the elevations of the different major components where the heat exchanger is, the secondary heat exchanger, the radiator, the, the you know, the, the reactor vessel and the dump tanks, you know, we knew approximately where they were, but we didn't have the actual inch by inch elevation data. And so we couldn't trust the the uh, thermal hydraulics that we were modeling, even though we thought our CAD was pretty accurate. It was, like I said, the, the, the Z direction was sort of a guess. And, uh, you know, the, the sad tragedy in, in my heart and mind is that if we had built the uh, molten salt breeder reactor or any molten salt reactors that o Oak Ridge had designed, and if we'd been building them for the last 40 years, we wouldn't be having this discussion because we would be in the same boat as light water reactors. You know, we'd have two generations, decades of actual performance data to go by. And we'd know, we wouldn't have to take guesses. We'd know exactly how the pumps work. We'd know exactly how long a pipe lasts. Is there anybody that wants to talk about that first question? If not, I'll keep going on. Well, so the, the second one is, and stop me anytime. How is modern modeling technology like the animal codes likely to be helpful today in a way that was not possible previously? You cannot escape how incredibly powerful modeling is for human factors, for design for assembly, design for maintenance, design for disassembly. That all is hugely advanced over the old paper and vellum ways in the past. Uh, you know, the, the amount but we're, 
but the fact is, and you all, no matter where you're coming from, industry or laboratory, you, you have to admit that, that while we can introduce a brand new car, you know, it, it used to take three to five years to introduce a car, right? And we're, we're, we are sub 18 months. We are down to some cars can get a new platform put out in under a year. So that industry is seeing the power of hugely interconnected CAD modeling and analysis modeling and, and, and uh, fabrication and rapid prototyping. Uh, I do not think we're seeing much of that in, in nuclear. And, uh, you know, I, I, want, I want somebody to leap up off of this uh, Zoom call screen and say, no, you're absolutely wrong, John. Uh, TerraPower built an entire valve set out of, out of rapid prototype, you know, fused titanium or, you know, and that's great. That's what we need. But we aren't seeing reactors getting stood up and built in two or five or 10 years. You know, every advanced, the oldest advanced reactor companies like TerraPower, you know, are eight, nine, 10 years into business and we haven't turned on a light bulb yet. So the power, as vast as it is, does not seem to be expediting the actual production of these systems. I, and uh, we can discuss why that is. Well, we got a muskrat that's very upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Uh, the uh, I'm not I'm not sure what uh, I think we had a little problem there, but uh, uh, if you guys can still hear me, uh, let's see here. So the John, the other... John, we can we can still hear you, John. This Ralph Hill. That was Walter Horsting. Evidently, was trying to speak, and it wasn't coming through clearly. No, no. So I'll I'll just try and get through this, and we'll we'll allow some. Uh, hopefully, Walter and some other folks can gather their thoughts and give it a second go. Uh, so it's like how to how to factor in the transformative changes at the NRC and uh, regulatory authorities elsewhere in the world. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you know, when I when I started this. Uh, as a big part of my business to get into this this business sector you know they they were you know the the the, the idea of an advanced reactor was a gas cooled reactor and it had been for 30 years at that point and the idea of the gen 4 reactors being taken seriously as a prime mover is uh is a huge leap forward and uh you know, I, I, I have no end in confidence that the NRC is, is doing everything they can as quickly as they can to, to show leadership. And if it gives you any hope, uh, this is probably a mostly US-based audience here. You know, when we talk to folks in Brazil, even India, you know, uh, Israel, South Africa, Malaysia, they all want us. They want they want the NRC to remain the gold standard. They trust the NRC to do a good job. And so that, that, should, be a, that should be a huge motivator for any NRC folk on the, on the call. Uh, and it should make you feel good. You know, the world wants the USA to lead in this. And uh, we can't, we shouldn't disappoint them. We shouldn't let other countries uh, take this over. You know, it's, it's too important of an industry. It, you know, too much of our national security and industry relies on us to, to start the new nuclear build that's been long promised. So the second to final question is uh, flexibility for the designer and the operator, the performance-based construct states that you can show more flexibility than blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't want to read everything for you, but maybe you begin with the relatively low confidence in the margins and the licensing system can be used to parlay any increase in confidence. So that's the philosophy, right? That's great. And uh, can ANS 20.2 take advantage of this concept? 
Yeah, absolutely. We already are. Our IPD is built into the, the standard already. Uh, you know, and there's obviously opportunity to, to expand its influence. But as I said earlier, you know, we're, I don't believe we're going to make it the sole or primary tool. You know, it'll be, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, equal among many. <laughs> and so there's a lot of paths to defense in depth. And that's really what we want. You know, we safety. I, I personally think that, uh, you know, this idea of safety uber alles, uh, when it comes to saving the world is, um, uh, you know, as a philosophy, uh, you know, we all safety first is actually the primary reason for doing advanced reactors, right? So the gen four reactor is an inherently safe reactor. So my philosophy is if it's already inherently safe, do we have to do so much work in the safety part of it should we not give equal space to the, the the factory fabrication of this the siting the financing the the rollout i'm not saying don't do safety obviously that's that's not what i'm saying my saying is that that you know the old walk and chew gum it's like if we feel that there is a dire imminent time that we must, you know, strike and make this happen. And, you know, we need, you know, tens of thousands of megawatts of carbon free energy to enter the grid that's 24 seven, not intermittent, rotating generation to keep industry alive. If and that is nuclear, nuclear is the only thing that fits that bill. And if we really believe that, then we've got to, you know, get, we got to get going. We, can, we, we, we just, otherwise, then, you know, just, then we just have to call this an academic exercise and, you know, thumb twiddling and just a nice thought. And, and then the rest of us have to pray to God that China and Russia and South Korea, Korea build the thousands of reactors that are needed in this world while we just sit and spin our wheels. And that would be the worst, worst second place prize in the world, you know, saying I told you so is the worst second place prize. The first place prize is saying we did it. So we got inherently safe reactors, right? They're fit through physics. They can't, you know, cause a problem theoretically, not, not huge exploding problems. They can, they can be problematic and uneconomic perhaps, but they aren't gonna, you know, bring down, you know, a, a city. So that being said, let's get on with it. You know, and part of that is, you know, I'm, you know, come hell or high water, ANS 20.2 is going to get finished so that people can start using it to build their reactors. Yeah. Hey, John, and, uh, and uh, is... well, hold on one second. I got a one question. It says if Gen 4s are inherently yep. safe, how is the safety regulation to be set and tested? Well, uh, and there's a couple of uh, chats before that as well, too. So you've got yeah. a few questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll roll back on those and I'll just finish this last one. It's just short. How can RP3C help? And uh, right before this meeting, you know, opened up to uh, everyone, you know, uh, RP, RP3C is, you know, it's, it's doing, it's doing the thankless, unenviable work of trying to get this work done. <laughs> and anybody and all of us who volunteer our time for this, I don't think anybody's getting paid for this. Or, you know, if they are, they're only getting paid because it's kind of sort of part of their job. I'm not getting paid for it, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, this time is not billable time for me. So, you know, keep doing it. Hang in there. I, I, think, I think we are going to finally speed along very rapidly the, you know, the, the new nuclear build. I think... I think the chickens are going to come home to roost on some of these other energy systems that are unreliable. And finally, you know, we're just like Churchill said, but in a nuclear sense, we will do the right thing after we've tried everything else, right? <laughs> so in the meantime, I asked Prasad, I said, if we could have a more distinctive, he, you know, there's obviously case studies and such, but if we could build up a library of videos and 
easy to read case studies, then this would, that's my opinion that it would help. You know, instead of just a big rule book, it would actually give examples of how to, how to actually implement this, this, you know, powerful tool. So we've got two questions. One's from Tom, uh, Tom Levisa, uh, to everybody. So you can see it if you open up your chat box. How about the CNSC and the vendor design review? I did a lot of work with terrestrial up in Canada, and I think the vendor design review is, you know, one thing that you may or may not know is that the NRC asked terrestrial energy and the CNSC if they could be observers to the vendor design review process. And uh, I would have to assume they're doing that because they want to, you know, uh, apply those lessons learned and that's that sort of technique. What's great about the vendor design review, in my opinion, is that it's it's uh, 18 distinct parts and you can do them one at a time. So if you're a startup and you don't have a billion dollars for your startup, then the, uh, uh, then, but you do have some money, then you can tackle it, you know, eat the chocolate elephant one bite at a time. Whereas it seems like the NRC requires, you know, one giant massive, you know, data dump. And so you have to have the wherewithal to put together an entire submission all at once and with the vendor design review you have vdr1 and then you pass that and you got vdr2 and you pass that and then you go on to things like uh you know public feedback and and uh, a formal licensing process but it's i think it's a i think it's an easier way to eat the chocolate elephant than one gigantic bite and i would like to think that if the nrc is up there observing the process then Hopefully they'll bring some of those lessons learned back. And then Bill Chemek said, uh, if Gen 4s are inherently safe, how is the safety regulation to be set and tested? Well, uh, actually, if you if we go back, let's see if this thing will work here. If we go back up here, some of the some of the commentary, if you download or, or Prasad makes available the document. These comments were much longer, and Cyril Cyril Roddenberg's in particular uh, answered that in that, and uh, you know, hopefully, Dr. Holcomb could give some input to that or Prasad. But the the idea is that you know, if it's inherent safety, you know, that does actually create a problem. Like for instance, one of the uh, passive safety cooling systems. Uh, on terrestrial's reactor, it was passive, right? And a perturbation like a telephone pole going through it uh, in a windstorm would punch a, punch a hole in the, in the cooling system. And in effect, it might open it up to the atmosphere, but in, it also made the cooling more effective. So if you're going to do that, you know, you know it's, it, it was not a binary thing. It's like, well, you didn't lose your passive cooling system. Is it still a passive cooling system? Yes, it is. How's the performance? It's actually better now. It's like, do you want to fix it? What's well, like, well, yeah, obviously you're going to want to fix it. So it's, you know, it sort of goes, it's counterintuitive to the original, uh, you know, the, the idea, like something breaks, you know, shut the whole system down. And, you know, if, if you're working on a gen four molten salt reactor, you might have a pump in there that isn't needed. The pump is in there to make the reactor run better and more economically, but if it shuts down completely and seizes up, maybe you're down to 80% of your power instead of 100%. So how do you accommodate that? Do you, do, you, do you have a license that says that you can derate your own power? You know, and it's, what's the loss of a pump? Is it, is it a safety issue? Nope. You know, so do you shut down the whole system because you lost a pump? I don't think you do. You know, you shut down the system when you got a new pump to put in there. In the meantime, you run it on three pumps or five pumps out of the six or four, you know, so that's the sort of philosophy that nothing, nothing creates a hazard in the system. That should be part of the design philosophy. You know, a pump shouldn't be, you know, 
one one out of six pumps shouldn't be a reason for shutting down an entire system. You know, one out of six valves failing or getting locked open or locked shut should not be a reason for shutting down an entire system. I, I hope that that's my take. I hope that answers your question. And then M. Ray Schneider, you guys can see it if you open up your chat. The purpose of RIPB is not to replace standard engineering practice, but to allow risk to be considered to avoid excessive emphasis on areas of low benefit. However, to make the process useful and credible, we need valid data to feed the risk assessment. However, even with uncertainty, the RIPB process can provide valuable insights to the developer in allocating resources and identifying potential issues. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Back in the real world engineering that I used to do a lot more, I, we still do it, but we used to, you know, we used to steal the idea from Toyota, you know, the Kanbai system, the house of quality. And part of the house of quality was, you know, tackle your worst problem first. And then when that's done, then you tackle the second worst problem. And then the third, you know, it was a very simple philosophy, but it was, it was surprising, you know, that it was, it was a little bit difficult to implement the house of quality, but when you did, you built up a, a, um, a, a beneficial cycle of improvements. When you improve this, the knock-on effects went throughout the whole system. And so I, I kind of look at RIPB that way. Uh, RIPB is, if you ask me, it's, it's way better than Six Sigma because Six Sigma, all it does was say, all right, you're going to do this, this thing exactly the way you say you're going to do this thing, and you're going to do it consistently. It doesn't ask you whether you're doing it right or wrong, whereas, whereas RIPB is actually, you know, making you examine, hey, am I doing this right? <laughs> is, is this the best way we could be doing this, you know? And that's, so that's my takeaway. I think, I think applying something like Six Sigma to a new advanced reactor design is, you know, is, is inappropriate. It's, you know, all Six Sigma does is make sure you're doing the thing you're gonna do consistently. And well, uh, does anybody else wanna discuss these, uh, these questions or bring up uh, anything else? I, you know, I'll ask uh, Prasad. John, if I may, I'd like to ask if uh, there are others from the ANS 20.2 working group on this call and, uh, you know, whether you would like to say something about, uh, you know, how uh, the, the standards group is handling, you know, the issues related to risk-informed and performance-based uh, approaches. Uh, I'm kind of scrubbing through the names here. Kurt Harris is is on, but uh, I'm, my quick uh, scan doesn't uh, I'm not uh, well, not jumping out at me. <laughs> so. I, I guess then I would uh, ask uh, the others in the in the audience whether you know some of the issues that uh, John has brought up. Uh, you know, do they resonate with the work that you're doing? And if so. Do you have any success stories to share with John? So, uh, you know, the ANS 20.2 working group can benefit from it. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would uh, very much appreciate any feedback that I could share back with uh, the ANS 20.2 team. I guess I have a question. Uh, have, have you been in contact with our uh, uh, the JCNRM in, in terms of, you know, have you feeding the standard back like SCORA or standards development or uh, any part of the uh, ANS, uh, uh, ASME JCNRM Joint Committee on Risk Management? So I mean, well, would you, believe... you want to have interaction maybe with, with something? Yeah, yeah I mean, if there's some informal interaction, I'm not a, I'm not aware of it, but I'm, I, my guess would be that, that Dave Holcomb, who's the lead of the ANS 20.2 team, uh, 
I should just say, you know, as a very brief aside, Thorium Energy Alliance, part of our, you know, we've got some generous supporters that have, you know, that uh, have been uh, making donations and supporting our work. And part of it is that, you know, this isn't free. We, you know, I have a, I have a guy back at my office who spends a crazy amount of time actually trying to organize and manage the writing and uh, he collects all the documentation and smushes it all into one word file you know with all the comments and you know keeps track of what's been addressed and what's been voted on and uh and that's why i'm here is that uh you know i there's there's no one paying dr holcomb there's no support for the rest of the folks from terra power or uh, moltex or anywhere else to do this work or thorcon so I, uh, the reason I'm here is that Thorium Energy Alliance wants molten salt reactors in the world. And so we decided to devote some resources and, and we actually do pay our guys to do this work and not myself, obviously, but you know, <laughs> Vince gets paid and, and, uh, and we pay for the zoom. So, I mean, that's, it's not a lot, but you know, it's 30 bucks a month that no one else, you know, we're not, no one's given that to us. We, it comes out of our budget to do that. <clears throat> And so we've made a lot of progress in the last year. So <clears throat> that editorial aside, that might explain why you're seeing my my face on your computer at the moment. Like, where'd this guy come from? <laughs> so so that's why we're doing it. We're you know we're we're spending the money and resources to try and expedite 20.2 into existence. Uh, that being said, we're we're very close to getting to the uh, balloting stage for 20.2, and that would be my guess to answer your question. Finally, is that I would imagine that they want to get the document to uh, to a milestone, to a stage where it's being balloted and uh, all pretty and, uh, you know, get its hair combed and brought to the uh, dog show. Uh, and then we could display it to the world and see what the rest of the ANS committees and folks have to say about it. I think yeah. folks will like it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that the the big weakness is, is going to be that when we see this for the uh, for the first time, we're probably going to need to be educated as to what's in it because the technology is different than most of the members of the J Center and would would be familiar. With. There, there are some who are who are yeah. like I see Matt. I see Matt here, and the, uh, but there there are some who who are familiar with uh, the uh, the the new technologies. And uh, but if we ha but but if we can be a if we could help make a contribution to trying to make the uh, the risk informed aspects more palatable to you and 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 make it feel like it it it's really uh, uh, an, an important part of your uh, your 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 process, I, I think we would like to help that as a as a as a organization. But I and, and trust us, we understand all your pains with with doing all the stuff for free. Uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's gonna you know. So, See, there's a question from Dan Yerman. Uh, uh, John, do you want to read it? Uh, sure. Respond. Dan Yerman. Love your uh, website, by the way, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Dan Yerman said, if you want to develop cases for using these methods, industry and government labs will need to charter a knowledge engineering effort to capture lessons learned, to write and distribute content so that there is a process of continuous improvement. Could ANS lead such an effort? Well, the idea, John, is that every time you build a full-size reactor or a prototype and you go through the test process, you have this third party that comes in and shadows it through the entire thing from soup to nuts and captures all of the efforts, including the failures as well as successes, and writes it up and puts it into an accessible uh, format uh, so that uh, the next guy can learn from it. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, if, if anyone has delved into the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab archive from the molten salt reactor experiment, the, the level of documentation that they did was, was astounding, you know, and so beautiful, you know, it, it makes you cry. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's almost emotional to read it, you know, the, and to, to talk to somebody like Sid Ball, you know, these guys, you know, we're just a small group, just 30 guys, you know, in their 30s. And they they pulled that off 
unbelievably well and they the documents that that uh, are left behind uh, you know it's going to be uh, it's going to be the one reason why we'll ever get this done because they they blazed the trail and you're right Dan if uh, if 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 anything of any significance you know if Christian Abilene University or somebody gets one of these things built in the west or god willing the chinese are very kind and are willing to share some of their information with us, you know, on the TMSR, you know, if any of that, we have to hope that, you know, we can hope to do as good a job as the MSRE team did so that, you know, we just, we have an upward spiral of innovation and, and success. Otherwise we just keep reinventing the freaking wheel. Well, in terms of getting resources, why couldn't ANS partner with the NRC and DOE? Right? Kind of a three, three-legged stool here to put together an effort like this, and not wait for China to say, may, "Mother, may I?" Yeah. Well, uh, that would would I would imagine as the the industry group. I mean, isn't that their job? <laughs> you know? Well, well uh, that's why I'm talking about the idea here. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, I I think uh, the question you ask is. Could ANS lead such an effort? Uh, I, I think in theory, the answer is yes. But, uh, you know, right now, I cannot think uh, of a mechanism by which uh, ANS could do it. I don't know if Pat, uh, Pat Schroeder, if you have any thoughts to offer on that. Oh, Prasad, maybe we can talk about that, you know, sometime after this. Uh, it's not it directly standards related and there might be someone else at ANS that might have you know better insight into what well, ANS I, may I be able to, to do. I mean I'll tell you what the you know the only other group out there that comes to mind that would do it would be NEI right but you know the 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 giant elephant in the room is who's going to pay for it right Who, who's going to who's going to pay the cumulative Two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollar an hour fee for a bunch of experts to to do this, you know, and and it's, you know, it'd be chump change in any other industry, and in this one, you know, it'd be like pulling teeth and uh, trying to get tears from a crocodile. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, it's it, it, it nuclear aside from what anybody says is insanely cheap. You know, the, the things that could be done with a billion dollars, you know, a billion dollars, I always tell people billion dollars is the advertising budget for a Ford Fiesta. And yet we took, for us to get a couple hundred million dollars out of the DOE, we do cartwheels and sing Hosanna. And it's like, what has the greatest, greatest payback on earth? There is nothing that has a better multiplying effect of benefits to humanity than the nuclear power. And yet, you know, we, we run around like beggars with our tin cup looking for you know, like breadcrumbs. <laughs> so when you when you look at the subsidies for renewables, you know, it'll make you gouge your own eyes out. Um, uh, so Bill Temek uh, has another comment that folks in the Maryland area are saying LFTR is at least 10 years away from reality. Is that even approximately correct? I would say it's at least 10 years away from reality. Yeah, I mean, that to me, I actually helped come up with that name, Lifter. It was supposed to be uplifting, right? But I think uh, it's probably just smarter to stick with the Gen 4 name at this point, just say molten salt reactor, uh, liquid fluoride, you know, thorium reactor is probably a little too on the nose. You know, it sort of cuts out Terra Power. It cuts out, you know, any, you know, anyone who's working with a chloride salt, you know, so it's, uh, I think it's just, you know, all boats rise with the tide. We should probably just call them MSRs. And unfortunately I've been, I was working with terrestrial power for over eight years and uh, uh, terrestrial energy, um, Thorcon, you know, Terra Power for even longer, uh, you know, although Terra Power has some, some very good effects test reactors and salt making capabilities so that that's you know they're they're doing the things that i suggest but you know i don't other than christian abilene i don't see you know the msr mark ii <laughs> you know coming down the pike anytime and 
the godsend about Christian Abilene is that it's a it would be a research reactor, and so that falls under a different part of the NRC licensing, and so that would that that actually stands a chance of of uh, happening because you know they aren't trying to be a power reactor, and so hopefully that isn't one of one. <laughs> Hopefully that's like one of many, but uh, let's, you know, any, any port in a storm, I'll take anything at this point. Uh, but yeah, 10 years, hopefully not, you know, hopefully, I hope the, hopefully not 10 years, but that wouldn't blow my mind if, if that was what it turned out to be. But we are approaching the end over here. There's one question from Ed Wallace. Perhaps you can just quickly. Ed Absolutely. Ed Wallace. What are, in your view, the barriers today that are essential to eliminate hurdles that weren't faced by developers in the 1950s? We know more today with much better tools, and yet it is a lot more difficult to achieve comparable results quickly. Marginal improvements over the last few decades haven't been the answer. Absolutely, uh, Ed, I mean, uh, you know, the, the I've already admitted to my bafflement that those modern tools haven't, you know, there's so many industries where the turnaround time to introduce and create new, uh, new cars, new appliances, new computers, new cell phones, new chips, new satellites, new rockets, you know, look at SpaceX, you know, I mean, you can't say, oh, it's because nuclear is this highly regulated industry you know, what's more regulated than airframes and spacecraft? I mean, almost nothing. And yet they are able to overcome this. This uh, So, I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go down the boogeyman path of saying over-regulation. I think we can deal with the regulations. I think, uh, I, I think there's a huge amount of promise when it comes to uh, uh, open ledger you know, systems for managing uh, contracts and managing. So you could look that up. The open ledger system comes out of like the Bitcoin world where we could actually have open ledger wallets where we agree to do work, where we, we promise something to the NRC and the NRC promises something to us. And this is open source to everybody and we can see if compliance has taken place. And maybe that is a pathway to, to uh, expediting uh, new, new nuclear build. And then Ralph Hill said, GM just reported that they are going to do away with gas and diesel by 2035. How do we ensure there is enough electricity to power the electric vehicles on this scale? I don't know. Some guys claim that, oh, you're going to power them up at night. So you'll be able to just keep making the same amount of power day and night. And uh, I'd like the solar guys to answer that. How are they going to make the same amount of power day and night? Ah, so <laughs> Paul Curran. Thank you for all your efforts. The world needs this technology much more than they need a MR, MNRA. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe both. But as you say, nothing has a better payback or benefit for humanity. Keep the faith. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we intend to. We've been at it for almost 15 years now. And, you know, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're Sisyphus pushing that rock up the hill, but at some point we're going to push it up and over the hill and we're going to, we're going to drag humanity kicking and screaming, you know, it's like I said, after, I always say the Churchill quote, you know, after we try everything else, we'll finally do the right thing and build up, build out a thousand nuclear power plants like we need to. Uh, anyway, John, this is uh, about the end of uh, the hour long uh, sessions that we try to keep uh, the community of practice uh, uh, sessions to. I want to thank you very much, you know, for sure. uh, what uh, what you have put together. I, I think it was a very entertaining conversation, and uh, I appreciate everybody having participated. Uh, please let us know if you have any other comments, uh, you know, uh, and. Uh, uh, as I think was mentioned before, uh, a recording of this will be available on the ANS website, uh, the RP3C landing page, as, uh, uh, as was mentioned. So uh, thank you all very much for participating and uh, have a nice and safe day. All right. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful that you allowed me to speak to the group, Prasad. Thank you very much. And I, I hope... Uh, I hope uh, at least one or two nuggets of uh, 
information floated into some people's heads and helped them. <laughs> so well, thank you folks. for your uh, efforts and, you know, uh, helping us make this happen. So absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Anytime. Thank you all. And if anyone